to start also with, oh no, the recording is already started. Yes, perfect. Um, hello everybody um, to today's webinar. Um, my name is Tobias Franz. I'm a lecturer in economics and member of the, of the CISD. Um, I teach on several courses and I'm currently in the um, online program of global cooperation and policy. Um, so what I wanted to today um, is to have a bit of an overview of um, give or give a bit of an overview about the way in which not just the COVID-19 crisis, but in general, how the current situation um, affects both uh, all you know corporations as well as uh, households and the kind of government responses that that um, can or has happened and the ones that that can happen so uh, more or less i will speak about you know give a brief introduction about three crises that i identify i'll get to that in a little bit um then uh, we i'll start and or then i continue with taking stock so where have we been uh, all in terms of where have corporations been what have household experience leading up to this current crisis and what have government responses or government policies largely looked like so far. So this is the first bit that I want to look at. And then the, then the, the second part, we'll look at the COVID-19 impact more, more or less, where are we now? So what are corporations experiencing? What are households going through? And what have been sort of the first government responses? And then the, the, to conclude, some policy implications and think about where are we going, right? So where have we been, where are we now, and where are we going? Um, I will, I don't have a, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, if you wish, you know, you can, you can now see me and it, may, it might be a bit more engaging. I'll, uh, I'll share some um, graphs every now and then with you guys. Um, and if at any point you want to, to speak or ask something, there is the little bottom button on your lower, lower hand side, um, that you can raise your hand, that gives me a notification and um, I'll finish the point that I'm making and then uh, give the word to you if um, you in, in, in any, in, at any point want to ask anything or want a clarification from me. All right, great. So without further ado, then I would just uh, start by giving a few, in, a, a brief introduction. So I would think or I would identify three major crises that are quite inherently uh, interdependently connected and oh and also something that i wanted to, to tell you I, I will speak uh, for about half an hour maybe 40 minutes let's see and then we of course have time for a discussion either through in the chat box um, that you can access on your right hand side or we can uh, you know with uh, if there's any questions or any comments afterwards then we have time to discuss them okay so, uh, as I said, I, um, I, would, I would identify three interdependently connected crises. The first and the most obvious one is, of course, the health crisis that has been triggered by the outbreak of the global pandemic, COVID-19. Right? The second crisis that is, uh, is the economic crisis, which is unprecedented and will likely to be the worst economic recession since uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, and last but not least, the third crisis that has been now uh, put to display more than ever before is um, a crisis of racism that we have been living through, and not just in our systems of law enforcement that are more evident with the murder of, uh, of black and minority ethnic people at the hands of the police, but also a racist crisis that is um, within our global system of or economic organization. I will also talk about how they are interconnected and then draw back um, on the three different units of analysis, corporation, households, and government policies onto all of these three different crises, right? So how is the health crisis connected to the economic crisis? Well, first, of course, in terms of countries having to shut down their economies, to slow down the spread of the virus um, has affected the economy um, because production has all but ceased. So by the multiple vectors through which the health, health crisis has disproportionately uh, affected the poor and disproportionately affected 
uh, black minority ethnic groups uh, in the global north and um, ethnic minorities in the global south. Um, also, casualized worker that we used to call low skilled, uh, you know, low skilled employed, uh, now rebranded as essential workers. Um, and the masses of informal workers in the global south uh, that don't have access to safety nets, social services, are uh, arguably the worst off from this health crisis, as well as in terms of their economic perspective to um, coming out of this crisis or living through this crisis indeed. The racist crisis has been dominant, a dominant feature of economic organization since colonial times when European whites used a racialized um, and gendered workforce to extract surpluses. Um, in, um, but that is also very intimately connected to the earlier two points that I, may, um, that I made, since both health impact as well as the brunt of, econo of the economic crisis is most health mostly felt by black minority ethnic communities in the global north and minority ethnic groups in the global south. So this is where this interconnecting, these, these crises are interconnecting. And in light of this um, and, and the challenges all of these three crises pose to our society, the economy, the organization of countries, of multinational organizations, of firms, I want to focus on three categories within economic thinking. So one is the corporation of firms. Particularly, I want to look at multinational enterprises and international financial capital. Secondly, I want to look at household um, or labor uh, workers more generally. And third, um, and more also very important, on, on government and policies. Right? Um, so let's start with taking stock of where we have been coming into this crisis. Where, was, where were corporations to start with, right? So ever since the 1980s, um, growth, particularly in the global north, and we, when we talk about the global north, we mean the United States, the, the United Kingdom, um, and uh, the European countries, but also Australia um, and Oceania more generally. So growth in the global north is, since the 80s has been largely stagnant, uh, with barely any year recording much above 3% GDP increases, and that is particularly visible even more so since 2000s, when, 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 since the year 2000, when growth has been largely stagnant. And as part of this ongoing systemic failure to spurt economic growth, um, corporate profits were, of course, also falling. And accentuated by the oil crisis of the 1970s, multiple economic crises of the 1980s and 90s, and then the burst of the dot-com bubble, at the beginning of the 2000s, firms saw their profits decrease, particularly their profits in uh, the manufacturing sector. However, rather than thinking about public policy solutions to reverse some of the neoliberal reforms that I would argue largely responsible for these developments, what we saw is an, a massive and drastic reorganization of firm structures. Um, and uh, rather than thinking about how to invest uh, in research and development, how to achieve high productivity growth, mean, meaning uh, how much output per worker can be generated, that, that is what we, what we call as productivity growth. So rather than thinking about how to achieve that, a lot of firms restructure their organizations to think about how can we achieve the highest profits through financial means so through uh, this financial speculation and investment in, into financial um, mechanisms and financial vehicles right um, so a lot of the non-bank firms so the, those those firms that traditionally have nothing nothing to do with finance other than accessing finance to reinvest in the real economy to achieve growth and, and, and productivity growth um, they started to massively invest in, in financial uh, vehicles. So this is what we call financialization of the economy, which is a very uh, pre um, omnipresent feature, if you will, of the global economy since the 1980s, which has largely led to a decrease in manufacturing profits while financial profits surged. So um, finance, traditionally, in the traditional sense of the word, and, um, and how it has been 
analyzed as well as used throughout the 20th century in achieving uh, growth, um, which was largely one that facilitated investments, it became finance became an end goal in and of itself. So we can appreciate this uh, financialization of the economy and what it did to uh, to 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 um, uh, profits. All right, this is a very low quality image, uh, but you can you can still see that this is the U.S. economy. We see we see especially um, following the 1980s a massive drop in manufacturing uh, sector size as a percentage of GDP, whereas finance, insurance, real estate, rental, and leasing surpassed um, the, the sector size as percentage of GDP. And this is an interesting development on um, several fronts, um, particularly the fact that, G that finance in itself does not contribute to anything that is real, to any product, rather than a uh, financial product is not, is, is not nothing really tangible that, that would make an economy more productive um, necessarily. So there, there, are, there are clear problems uh, related to this financialization, to which I get to throughout today's lecture as well. So this shift towards the financialized system of organization of firms was particularly evident in countries of, of the global north, with the US and the UK as the leading country in this respect. Um, both the US American as well as British corporation increased their financial activities at home while also starting to outsource and reorganize their manufacturing uh, parts. So more and more was outsourced to countries of the global south that became inter integrated in what is known as global value chains. And I'm sure some, if not all of you, have heard of this term before. Uh, yeah, but um, um, the participation of countries in, this, in these global value chains generally represented a chance for, particularly for countries in the global south, to move up their value and productivity ladder. However, the way in which multinational enterprises, in coordination with domestic elites from those host countries in the global south, organized this integration of these countries into the lower end of global value chains, this has had rather disappointing results, I would argue because they largely failed to achieve what we would call positive spillovers. So if a multinational organization, multinational enterprise would, would come in into a country of the global south, what would lead to an increase in productivity and to uh, moving up the value ladder would be so-called forward or backward linkages that this multinational enterprise would achieve with domestic companies, right? But this is largely something that didn't happen because but, um, multinational enterprises largely focused on extracting cheap uh, labor as well as cheap resources from those countries, um, leading to some economists such as Suwandi uh, who calls this move, uh, she calls it a new economic imperialism. So reinforcing uh, a sort of uneven development uh, between the global north and the global south uh, through the mechanisms of global value chains and global corporations. And part of this move away from production towards financialization and the trends to outsource more and more of the production process to countries of the global south where cheap labor is abundant and cheap resources are readily available also meant now that in the health crisis the capacity of, of countries in the global, global north such as the US and the UK more, most prominently largely failed in their provision of, of, of protective gear, of ventilators, because there's no capacity in, in the UK, in the US, to actually produce these ventilators, because they are produced in China or in other places. Um, and so this uh, substantially uh, hindered or slowed down um, apt responses of the government. But I get to that also later. Right? And we see them, the, the worst rates of infection and deaths, particularly in the United States and the United Kingdom. What did these developments mean for households and particularly for workers or labor, both in the global north as well as the global south? So where have we been with households? This would be the next point 
So the, the, the shift towards a more financialized system of accumulation meant that productivity rates in the manufacturing sector stagnated. And what usually happened as well throughout the golden age of capitalism in the 50s, 60s, and 70s with productivity rising, meaning uh, output per worker, output per hour would increase, meaning a worker would get more and more valuable to a corporation. And that translated into higher wages, right? This, is, this has been the case for the, throughout the 20th century, but with this financialization and the outsourcing of uh, productivity, uh, of uh, manufacturing, we saw a stagnation in wages throughout the global north. Um, particularly, and a good example is my country of origin, which is Germany. Germany is one of the countries that has most successfully, if you will, suppressed wages um, to maintain international competitiveness with their exports. But yeah, in general, this shift towards a more service-based economy like in the UK, we saw uh, average wages uh, uh, stagnate or even decrease in real terms, meaning uh, while um, inflation continued to increase, it increased and, and wages increased less than inflation to some extent, real wages stagnated or in some cases even decreased. That meant on one hand we see more and more working poor in, in, in countries of the global north as well as the global south, but also a lot of people taking on second and third jobs to, uh, to be able to um, make their ends um, and, 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 and afford rent, food or basic supplies. So but at the same time, as I said, inflation increased, so the price of living, the price of consumption, all of these uh, indexes continue to increase while wages relative, were relatively stagnant. Meaning households had to start in debt themselves. So had to start when much more uh, uh, think about, we need to access credit and in debt ourselves in order to finance our living, right? And this trend uh, of financialization because households had to become integrated into a financial market, if you will, because of their, their, their need to access uh, credit through the financial market, meant that this financialization also translated into a massive increase of household debt um, in throughout the global north particularly, but also in other countries. Um, so this is one of the most prominent features of, uh, of financialization. If we look at this graph that I put up now, uh, we see that Great Britain uh, has about 90% of, um, of household debt um, as a percentage of GDP. Uh, similar numbers in the United States, Germany, France, Singapore, Japan, are all around 50%, but in Canada even above 100%. So there's higher debt rates on households on, and, 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 and total a higher debt um, than overall GDP, which is very worrying and very, very um, um, uh, disconcerting, particularly in as this current crisis shapes up to be uh, the worst in, uh, in two generations, right? So this is one of the things where households have been. They have increased their, their debt, um, their private debt, um, which on one hand, of course, made the, these households very vulnerable to changes in the financial sector uh, for, or, or, or even if, uh, uh, if there is an increase in interest rates from the Bank of England or, or uh, the US Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank, that would translate to uh, an increase in the interest rates that households would have to pay on that debt. So they made, that made them on one hand very vulnerable, but also it increases the overall fragility of the financial sector and the global economy at large. Why? Well, because what we saw also with the financial crisis and uh, leading up to the financial crisis with the massive uh, uh, influx in mortgage and mortgages that were given out um, to households um, that indebted themselves uh, by, you know, getting mortgages and getting a house, etc. There, once once prices or, or interest rates on these mortgage payments increased, households had to default on them, meaning the financial sector uh, was no longer able to get the liquidity it needed um, uh, for for survival, if you will, 
And uh, this ripple effect then led to the financial crisis. So overall, private debt is not just serious, a serious problem for households themselves, but also for the economy and the financial sector more generally. Right? So the, uh, as a third point, uh, where have we been? Um, let's talk about government and policies. So as part of this neoliberal turn in the 1970s and 80s, governments across the world implemented far-reaching reforms that mainly saw a radical transformation of economies in form of privatization of state-owned enterprises, a deregulation of a wide range of sector, um, financial and economic liberalization that would facilitate the movement of capital as well as trade. And overall, we saw weakening of employment rights, of environmental restrictions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, while these policies, mainly prominently implemented by Thatcher in the UK and Reagan in the United States, while they were intended to regenerate growth um, in, in the 19, late 1970s and early 80s, that largely did not happen. Nor did it improve conditions for the population. At, um, at, at large, as inequality rates since the 80s have surged globally, and particularly in the more, more advanced neoliberal states, such as the United States and the United Kingdom. Furthermore, this is crucial now uh, and going out of this crisis, it has left states and governments with a very minimal capacity to intervene into the markets as their power has been rolled back further and further. And this has left states with a very minimal capacity to, for fiscal stimulus in form of public spending that would, invest, uh, that would incentivize high GDP growth rates and productivity. As I said, something fiscal stimulus, prior public investment was something that was at the backbone of the golden age of capitalism in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and early 70s. And this was very much dominated by economic thinking that originates from the so-called Austrian school or monetarism. And in, of course, a lot of these terms, a lot of these things that I'm, I'm bringing up now, in uh, the module on international economics that I teach, for example, we go into depth on where these theories come from, what do these theories say. So, um, uh, of course, this is uh, very interesting for, for those of you who, 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 are, who are interested in this topic to then um, potentially join me in this lecture next year. And so this domination of the monetarist school or Austrian school, if you will, was um, mainly um, told governments to think about um, policy just as in, in monetary terms. So just think about how much money supply can go into the market, um, so how much of the Bank of England puts into the in, into the market um, and regulate inflation and and that is it. Uh, the government doesn't really do much else than regulate inflation and let the economy work by uh, the famous Adam Smith's uh, notion of the invisible hand. Right. This was the major shift in the 1970s and 80s away from a more active government policy on fiscal stimulus. Um, yeah, this was also very prominent in the in the recovery years of the global financial crisis, when governments um, uh, were mostly concerned with putting money into the market through so-called quantitative easing programs. Um, they um, these programs uh, are 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 created or are are uh, organized by um, the central banks of the respective countries. Um, uh, to, re, re, uh, to revive economic activity through uh, buying up government bonds and put it on or longer term securities from the open market to increase money supply and incentivize spending and investment for, uh, um, for corporations. So the idea is if corporate or if banks, commercial banks can access cheap money um, from central banks, they would give this cheaply into the form of credits to the real sector, to firms um, that then could use this to uh, invest in, um, in, uh, in employment and productivity growth. However, um, this uh, largely did not happen. Um, 
because a lot of the commercial banks, having been in difficulties uh, after the financial crisis and financial difficulties, often use this money to balance their own sheets or invest into financial products even further and increasing the discussed financialization of the economy as a result of a crisis that was largely um, due to the fact that we saw this financialization in the first place. Um, another imp important aspect of quantitative easing programs was that a lot of investors in the UK, the US and the, US, and the, and the European Union used this cheap credit to invest in non-bank corporations in the global south. So they used their, their, their euros, their dollars and their pounds to make investments in, uh, in uh, companies in the global south. So what we saw is a massive influx of, um, of indebtedness of co corporations, uh, both in the global north, because they were, they were still not able to access cheap credit, as well as in the global south, that were um, accessing this cheap credit, but through um, leveraged um, financial means and would indebt themselves through that. And what we saw it, since, since, especially since after the crisis, is a massive influx in um, lending of non-bank borrowers um, by US dollars, euros, as well as the yen. So if you, if you look at this graph that I put up now, um, we see a massive increase of um, foreign, U, uh, mostly US dollar dominated debt of of, of different countries. Of course, this is not just the global south and emerging economies. This is in, in general uh, the the lending that has been done by by non-bank borrowers in foreign currency. So, U.S. dollar lending would be done by all corporations that are outside of the United States. Uh, all foreign lending uh, of euros is done by corporations outside of the eurozone. So, this is another. Um, um, thing that has taken place um, of where we've been. So to take this retrospective uh, stock uh, of where we were before the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, we see that our global economy was largely dominated by, by large corporations that concentrated on generating income through financial speculation. They, that those uh, corporations were also highly dependent on the extraction of surplus from cheap labor and resources from the global south, and we had a massive influx of household as well as corporate debt as a result of financialization um, and the stagnation of wages and productivity. And we had a political organization of government that prioritized private and financial interests over economic policies that would create conditions for productivity growth and high wages. So this is the scenario in which we are beginning of 2020, beginning of this year, right? And this is where the crisis hits. This is where COVID-19 breaks out in March. Uh, the WHO um, calls it a global pandemic and everything changes. Literally everything, the way we know our life, the way we know our economies, the way we know a social organization, everything changes, right? Of course, there's been a lot of superlatives being thrown around about unprecedented crises, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it is not to underestimate the severity of this crisis for um, our society. So now I'll go through where we are now, right? Corporations, households, governments. Um, let's start with the impact of the pandemic on corporations. The global economy as the global economy is more integrated than ever, um, as I said before, with, in the global value chain, um, and corporations very much depend on the smooth running of these supply chains, of trade corridors, of just-in-time logistics, the pandemic and the lockdown imposed by governments uh, across the world meant three main things. First, it was a plummeting of production. Well, of course, if there is nobody else being able to go to the factories, nothing can be produced, right? Secondly, a complete collapse of demand. 
when there's no income uh, because of people being unemployed or being without or having to, to think re and reprioritize their spending, um, they won't consume. Right? There's no there's no there's no wages to consume, or the, the, the bit of money that's there is not done is not consumed in the way it was before. So demand completely collapsed, as well as demand for globally and demand for uh, for oil, gas, and I get to that in, in a little bit. And thirdly, there's a complete collapse of supply chains, and and on all of these three mechanisms, of course, reinforce each other. And this is why it makes this 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 is why it makes this pandemic so extraordinary in terms of its economic crisis, because usually in an economic crisis, so not a financial crisis, just an economic crisis, when, when we have a recession, we see a problem of effective demand, because wages will go down, unemployment will go up, people won't have income to spend on, so demand we have an effective demand problem in an economic crisis, right? In a financial crisis, what we saw in 2007-8, we have a supply crisis because corporations are no longer able to access money from financial institutions, meaning they will no longer able to be produced to be producing the same amount of goods that they did before. And what we see now uh, in, 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 with COVID-19, both of these things happen at once. So we have a massive supply and a massive demand crisis. Right? And of course, what happens to corporations in that is we, and we've seen already the first number, is when liquidity problems, meaning they can no longer access liquidity, turn into solvency problems that they can no longer, uh, uh, you know, pay their workers or pay their debt, and so they have to declare bankruptcy. And we already saw first bankruptcy happening throughout the world, and as the crisis will go on for quite a bit longer, especially the economic implications. Uh, and, and as governments are scaling down fiscal support, um, these bankruptcies are likely to become the norm. Uh, there's a lot of uh, doom and gloom, and I will get to a more positive side um, afterwards as well. So bear with me. For corporations in the global south, the, great, the crisis threw open a whole different set of problems. So while, while on one hand, of course, the demand for their the, their products that they produce within the global supply chains, but also um, for commodities, right? For oil, gas, zinc, zinc nickel, coal, uh, et cetera, that a lot of the countries in the global south, and particularly uh, uh, Latin America, which is my, my research interest, um, but depend on the production and the export of these commodities um, due to the fact that demand for these commodities fell because no longer was there any need for oil because factories were closed and there was no need to power these factories with oil. That meant uh, oil, as, as, as most of you might have heard, plummeted below zero um, dollars per barrel because it became more expensive to store the, the crude oil itself than, than, than actually the income from selling it. Um, this is why it fell below zero. So this income stream uh, dries up for corporations of the global south, as well as there's no longer access to external finance. Because for many years, as I said before, uh, corporations in the global south finance themselves through external finance um, and external funding through international financial markets, um, as, I, as I showed in the graph before, right? But this, of course, fell away. A lot of the investors that had invested in the global south now started to withdraw, massively withdraw capital from these emerging markets. In, a, in an unprecedented move, um, capital was, was withdrawn from emerging markets, and a lot of them, a lot of this capital flight, as we would call it, went into the US dollar, right? Even the gold uh, lost its value at some point vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US dollar. So a lot of the investors went into the US dollar, meaning the US dollar appreciated in its value while a lot of the local currencies depreciated, making the debt burden that countries have in US dollar overnight even more, more uh, uh, parlous than they'd already been before, right? So um, this um, is uh, more or less what we saw uh, happening in the in countries of the global south, as well as due to the fact that 
a lot of these countries have focused on integrating their economies, you know, as a part only into global value chains and not thinking about a product, uh, a sort of manufacturing base uh, in, in its entirety. A lot of these countries have now supply bottlenecks because they don't produce manufacturing goods themselves and they rely on uh, on imports of these of these manufacturing goods. So there's been a lot of supply bottlenecks happening also with food and medicine in uh, in countries of the global south. And that coming back to the point of more of the races and racial uh, racial um, uh, workforce and the racist problem in this organization is that all of these developments has have accentuated uh, problems of uneven development. So there's an increase of unevenness now than there, there has before um, between geographically unevenness between countries of the global north and countries of the global south. Um, so this economic new economic imperialism that I that I referred to earlier is seeing um, very problematic outcomes as part of this crisis. So how is this felt by households? Now I come to households. So first, and particularly in countries of the global south, there's a large number of workers that are employed informally or in casual employments with no real access to benefits or any social services or safety nets. Those workers lost their jobs. Um, and a lot of them had to migrate back from the city to rural areas. We saw that particularly in the case of India, where massive people migrated back from the city to back to the rural areas, not just accentuating their economic difficulties because of no more income from their jobs in the city, but also exposing themselves and their communities to the virus. Um, but of course, as well, unemployment in the UK is set to double. The US uh, has recorded an, 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 a record unemployment rate of almost 20% of the workforce. So this is a, a massive um, repercussions for uh, the workforce throughout the global economy. What, why is it particularly bad for the global south as well is that while multinational corporations have generated a large amount of profits by extracting surplus labor from this reserve army of cheap labor in the global south, they've now left their former employees without much support. As these ruptures of global supply chains, of course, led to a seizure of production, for example, in Bangladesh's garment industry, large multinational companies have stopped any payments and have not offered support. And of course, in these countries, uh, there is not a social service, a uh, social safety net that they can, that those workers can fall back on. And given that a lot of these workers are, are mainly uh, uh, women, uh, this and, 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 and often the sole breadwinners for their family, this has accentuated problems of uh, households in the global south in terms of their uh, poverty and, and even hunger. Um, so in fact, uh, it is now predicted that for the first time since 1990, um, uh, global poverty is set to increase um, rather than continue to decrease. So overall, uh, um, poverty will increase most likely for the first time since in 30 years. I'm now getting to the government side and I'll, I'll conclude with uh, some policy uh, conclusions and then we'll open it up. I hope, I hope you can stay on a bit longer given that we finished a bit later. So what are the short, medium and long run policies um, for governments? So interestingly, in the first few months of this crisis, we saw a major shift in economic thinking. Even the most fiscal conservative monetarist and Austrian school politician and public servant suddenly turned into uh, a half-baked Keynesianist. So all of a sudden it was no longer about austerity and saving and getting, getting the balance sheets of the, of the government, of, no, of the public balance sheets right, but rather we need to invest um, sort of fiscal expansionary policies and uh, public stimulus from uh, from uh, policies leading uh, leading to uh, yeah an increase in public spending. Uh, that of course shows very much very clearly that austerity measures have always been rather political than an economic choice. Um, and also concerns over public debt were put aside as central banks stepped in to guarantee public solvency 
Um, and this is also something that happened in the UK, for example. The different fiscal measures that were rolled out by, by, the, by the governments across the world, of course, uh, varied significantly, but um, one can generalize that they included funding for social services and healthcare as a more in, in immediate response, tax holidays for businesses and medium in the medium term, and loans and direct grants as long-term strategies to support businesses. The problem, however, with these longer term strategies, and that is something I would argue, is that, um, that this has put firms and corporations in a, a precarious situation coming out of this current crisis. Why? Well, because they already have problematic debt structures, as I, as I told you earlier. So repayment of these new loans has to be very carefully organized because what you don't want coming out of a crisis like the one we have is that corporations use the access to new funds to to repay old debt or to repay their debt rather than investing into new staff and investing into future production so that's why i would argue and i would follow with with uh, other economists who have argued that that this increase in debtness of corporations that we see now happening because a lot of corporations of course access these new credits and indebted themselves even further this will only delay this crisis temporarily as future rep repayments will inevitably affect investments and hence growth rates so i would join these economists in in in, in calling for a complete cancellation of debt not just for corporations but also for households and to actually get Households also not worrying about repaying their debt, but actually um, contributing to economic growth by, uh, by stimulating demand uh, in the population rather than, than having the population worry about repaying debt. So this is an argument that I would put forward for complete cancellation of, of private debt, which in my view is the most dangerous debt rather than the public debt. Uh, for countries in the Global South, of course, that don't have access to such fiscal means and support to support businesses. Um, the situation is a bit more complicated um, and external financing has uh, dried up, as I said, and commodity export have also slowed down. They are only left with the choice to applying to special grants from the IMF. Um, and in the first few weeks, indeed, of the pandemic, over 100 countries already applied to for emergency financing and debt relief programs. So. Uh, this is more or less uh, um, the the the, um, the policy choice for governments in the in, in the global south. However, there's another worrying trend that now seems to happen uh, more recently, in both here in the United Kingdom, but also in in countries such as South Africa, that that rather than continuing this fiscal stimulus from the government, uh, we see now calls from uh, from the exchequer uh, to re-establish austerity measures to think about we need to save again and this is in my point of view a very dangerous situation given that we're in the midst of the crisis um, and rather than thinking about scaling back uh, and and prioritizing austerity again i think it would be much more um, advantages for uh, for the economy to increase public spending. And we saw that, in, for example, in Germany, that's one of the cases where public spending has now been increased rather than scaled back. Um, household support, of course, has also varied substantially, but some countries have frozen all payments of bills, such as France, for example. Other, like the United Kingdom, have mostly focused on mortgage repayment freeze uh, with little or no support for renters. The furlough scheme, of course, was expanded um, and most vulnerable were supported. Uh, with increased access to financing. However, and as I said before, household debt is all, also likely to increase in this crisis, um, and total private debt is likely to increase and exceed GDP numbers. Um, and of course, for households in the Global South, this is different. Um, they have to scramble for survival. There's no jobs, no access to social services, no savings. Uh, no access to credit or 
uh, or if access to credit, then only uh, high interest rates. So this is a very disastrous cocktail leading to this increased level of hunger and poverty that I referred to earlier. So just to wrap up, what can be done? Well, on one hand, on a multilateral level, the IMF needs to expand uh, its special drawing rights program and for the further support a memorandum on, on debt or a complete debt cancellation by the G20 states for countries of the global south. And here the IMF has been quite um, active in, uh, in, in championing this cause um, and, and asking the G20 states to cancel or, or put a memorandum on debt payments for countries in the global south. On a national level, as a more immediate response, government, of course, need to continue supporting businesses by extending loan maturities, deferring taxes, uh, providing credit through central bank finance, and subsidi subsidizing companies to maintain employment. But also, of course, to mitigate pressures um, uh, in, for households. Uh, households could be supported by suspending payments or mortgage, rent, utility bills, but also, especially in the global south, by unconditional cash transfer programs and investing in social services more generally. There needs to be a drastic control on capital, uh, on capital movement, in my opinion, because of the way in which capital flight has increased the disastrous situation for countries of the global south. A continued effort of central banks to buy foreign currency to prevent further depreciation of local currencies, which have uh, increased the US dollar dominated debt in countries of the global south. So countries and uh, uh, central banks in the global south need to continue buying foreign currency to stabilize um, their own currencies. Then I think there's a need to support businesses beyond the current limited time frame and cancel the debt on corporations and households, as I said before. And then think about very strategic sectors, both in the global south and the global north, where governments need to take control and invest largely, and that is particularly sectors that are related to new renewable energies and to new technologies, to have these as two prime sectors that would take us out of the crisis. Um, interestingly as well, and that's where I'm going to conclude on, in terms of the firm structure, I would argue that we need to ban all tradable shares. Um, uh, that is, of course, a very radical step, but tradable sh shares were first introduced in, in 1599 with the creation of the East India Company. And I would think uh, if we don't ban these tradable shares, um, we, there will be no noticeable difference in the distribution of wealth and power coming out of these current crises. So this requires a shift away from a dominance of a very undemocratic organizational structure of mega firms and mega banks that have particularly increased since the, 19, uh, since the 2008 crisis, but rather uh, that shares should resemble uh, electoral votes. And here I, I, I'm in line with Yanis Varoufakis' arguments, who, who, who argues that, that every employee gets one single share um, in a company that can be neither bought, bought nor sold, and that would very much overcome problems related to this shareholder, maximizing, shareholder value maximizing ideologies where, where firms engage in buybacks of shares to boost shareholder value rather than investing in research and development and production. So for example, like students who receive a library card upon registration, the new staff of every company get a single share granting one single vote that can that can be cast in an all shareholder ballot, deciding every matter of the corporation from management and planning issues to the distribution of net revenues and bonuses. And this more shift to a democratic, radic radically democratic way of organizing firms, I think is a very interesting solution that will move us away from a lot of the problems um, that got us into these three crises and that define these three crises um, that I outlined above. So I apologize for the rather longer uh, uh, talk, um, and now I want to give it over to you uh, for any questions or comments uh, that you might have from this talk. So thank you very much for your uh, attention, and please ask away. <laughs>
So Natalia asks, hi, how can grassroots movement communities and average people help change this outlook? Yes, that's a very good, very good point. And, and as, as I alluded to in, in the conclusion, I think with grassroots movements um, or with a more grassroots organization of firms, that would be that would be a first start that um, that where a real organization of structures of, of company structures could happen. Um, of course, unions have been weakened throughout the last 40 years. Um, but that is one good move, uh, one good way uh, through which more um, democratic organization of companies can be achieved. On another hand, what we see, of course, with grassroots movement rising up against the more racist and racial uh, um, uh, attacks on uh, on black lives uh, is, of course, another another way through which this can happen. Um, and I think what is what is also interesting in this crisis is that it has given a lot of people a perspective on how how much their work and how much their their value has been um, yeah has been underestimated for such a long time. So I think that is something specifically when we think about this essential workers that for so many years have been branded non-skilled, how they have become so central to the way in which our economies are still working is, is something interesting to see, um, I think, um, and where a lot, of, uh, a lot of more grassroots movements have been taking place now taking up this, this argument um, for, for valuing work more, more generally. So I would think. Any other questions? I'm also happy you, you, you can also turn on your microphone and talk to me directly if you have any other questions. I hope this was, uh, was understandable for you, uh, that you could follow my train of thought. Um, and got interested a bit into in, 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 in these topics. So, okay, Simi is asking, I'm wondering, one, how nonprofits fits into the situation given their unique financial structure? Uh, yeah, this is, of course, another and very interesting aspect. Um, so what we see, for example, with um, in the UK, but also in other countries, that a lot of the money uh, and the fi and finance made available for corporations was not always extended to nonprofits. Um, and particularly now with the merger of DFID and the Foreign Office, um, nonprofits that work in uh, for work in the field of aid will have uh, extra difficulties in 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 in, in access to the already uh, difficulties with COVID nineteen. To access finance um, for debt for the direct relief of the the of the situation in a lot of the countries in the global south. Um, for nonprofits in the global north, of course, there's also similarly to uh, to other organizations the the problem of survival. And uh, and here some countries have stepped up um, quite a bit. To support nonprofit organizations, but in general, we see a trend uh, with um, financing away from that. On a different note, Simi asks how developing economies like African countries may approach the recovery to this crisis, especially given how many African countries their infrastructure is already broken. Yes, this is a very, very good point. And here, of course, uh, the, the question is on how not just what, what I just alluded to in terms of the restructuring of, of aid from, from the global north, but also how um, countries themselves can access finance through the IMF in ways that don't increase their debt patronage. So in the past, a lot of developing countries in the global south have 
increased or have accessed finance from the IMF and from the World Bank, but this was often done with conditionality. So an important aspect would now be to not put conditionalities on these special drawing rights that should be granted to these countries, but rather that these countries use this investment uh, in, in ways that can enhance productivity, for example, infrastructure uh, development. But also I would argue a lot of the, the way in which countries have been uh, made so sort of dependent on, 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 on aid and investment from abroad is that, uh, that a lot of these countries had to privatize as part of this conditionality in the 1980s and 90s of the Washington Consensus had to privatize their, their sectors and their public owned assets. So I would argue for a reversal of these privatization reforms that would then give, um, give governments not just um, um, sources of income, but also available resources that could be invested into, into infrastructure. How can we go about improving democracy in the workplace, Samuel asked. That is a very, very good question. And that is, of course, something that speaks directly to uh, a unionization of the workplace. And, um, and here I would, uh, you know, everybody who is in the workplace uh, call for uh, joining, that the, the they would join a union or they would inform themselves what kind of structures are already available in the workplace. Um, and of course, uh, we need to push for uh, from academic thinking, but also from grassroots movements and NGOs, etc., to challenge this anti-union laws that are in place, not just uh, in the countries of the global south, but also in countries like the United Kingdom, where Margaret Thatcher uh, has had um, in the 1980s um, implemented various policies that were quite anti-union. So. Here, a, a political shift needs to happen that would um, that would allow uh, more more yeah that would allow unionization as well as well as a, a more yeah m more grassroots movements within the union to organize to unionize and to challenge some of their, the 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 imbalances of power that exists in in the in the economy. So this would be my argument. So Maitri G, Maitri asks, in the midst of the pandemic in the global south, we see political unrest within the Indo-China border as well as ban of China produced products within India. Will this affect the global north in the production chain? That's a very good question. Um, and I would, I would, I would not think directly so because often within these global value chains, it isn't really countries that engage with interfirm or uh, or direct trade, but rather multinationals that take one product and ship it from uh, from the uh, from where the resources are sourced to the assembly. Of the, uh, uh, point which is in a different country to then uh, the final product which is in a different country etc. So a lot of those are not registered as as arm length trade. But of course I think what we what we do see with an increased nationalism throughout the world, the global economy and the global society, with Trump as uh, the leading figure in this and the neo mercantilist move to, towards more protectionism. And political nationalism, there of course is uh, serious challenges as well uh, that this creates for the global economy at large. And um, the, the 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 issue here, of course, is that a lot of people feel um, the the brunt of of being left out of these of of the benefits of the global value chains are now turning towards more nationalist uh, and populist leaders that endanger not just the global economy, but um, but more generally peace uh, throughout uh, the world, and, and China and India are two other good examples. Bolsonaro in in uh, Brazil is another example of where this happens quite in a way that is quite disconcerting. In addition to all of these issues that are raised. 
Simi asks, um, I'm curious about how you think the knowledge from the SOAS Global Cooperation Policy Master Program may be leveraged into job opportunities during and after the pandemic. That's a very good question, Simi. So of course, while my talk was quite a critical analysis of the overview uh, um, you know, of, of, of what has been going on and what, what is going on now, how the global uh, cooperation and policy masses program is very unique in its in its way in which you have um, a very interdisciplinary uh, access to very interdisciplinary um, scholars uh, and lectures. You you can choose uh, modules that have much more to do with uh, diplomacy. If it's something that that you know you're more interested in going into UN or NGO organizations, then you can choose. A lot of different modules that have to do with policy, uh, with, with diplomacy, um, and move towards more of a of a public servant or NGO career. Then there, of course, is the international economics program that is gives you a lot of the tools necessary for analyzing all of the different ways in which economies work. So we do a lot of theory. Uh, we apply a lot of the a lot of those theories to real world events and to firms um, and case studies of different firms. Um, as well as the multinational enterprises uh, module that I also teach, we uh, specifically look at more of the business organization side of things um, and how you could uh, influence uh, uh, efficiency levels in the corporation if that is the, 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 the path that you want to go down on. Um, so the, and there, the, given that we have these different pathways, um, there is something for you uh, guaranteed that would help you get a job in uh, during and after the pandemic. Yeah, as Fadil said, uh, the different destination of the program of CISD is available on our website. Um, so please also have a look there. Um, but yeah. So a lot of them, a lot of you guys are leaving. Uh, I hope that wasn't due to the fact that, uh, yeah, the, that you weren't interested in the talk, but it has been over an hour, and of course, attention spans and schedules are tight. Um, if there's no other questions, then I um, thank you very much for your attention. If there's any other questions that arise, you can always email me. I'm going to put the, the, my email address in the chat box. So if there's any other questions that you might have, um, please feel free to reach out um, and I hope you enjoyed today and would educating students about labor laws be helpful? Well, yeah, of course. Uh, of course, this is also something, Samuel, uh, that, is, uh, that is important and that is part of, of, uh, of the modules as well about different labor laws, especially the multinational enterprises program that looks at economic as well as legal perspective on um, all the multinational enterprises. So yes, this is definitely also something that's helpful. Okay. Thank you so much for this talk. It's been extremely informative. What's recorded, yeah, there's, there's um, yeah, as, as was just stated, uh, we will send the recording out in the next few days. Um, so you have access to that. If there's anything else in terms of sources that you need, um, also please reach out. Irene is asking, what has been the impact of COVID-19 on military spending? That is a good question that I am not able to answer from the top of my head. This is not really um, something that I follow too closely, but um, I would think it's has affected to some extent, but military spending is usually, particularly from the US uh, in the UK, not something that affected a crisis, rather than often within crisis, military spending increases due to the fact that there is more insecurity globally about the, about the situation um, on security issues. But I, I don't know. I would have to have a look at um, different countries and spending of military in different countries. <laughs>
Okay. I thank you very much for your attention. Um, as I said, if there's anything that arises, be it something to do with my lecture, something to do with uh, the course, the program, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, and I hope I'll see you in September, October, when the program start in October, um, and engage more with you. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. And there's Yes, do that, Samuel. It's a good idea. Um, okay. I'm also going to sign off. Um, you take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks, thanks, Tobias. Yeah, that's all right. Do you, do you want me to stay on for a bit, Father? Uh, no, I think it's cool. Yeah, it's cool. That's good. Thanks. We'll, um, we will get the recording. Um,